The first reading today is from Genesis 21, verses 8 to 15. The child grew, and on the day that he was weaned, Abraham gave a great feast. One day Ishmael, whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham, was playing with Sarah's son Isaac. Sarah saw them and said to Abraham, Send this slave and her son away. The son of this woman must not get any part of your wealth, which my son Isaac should inherit. This troubled Abraham very much, because Ishmael was also his son. But God said to Abraham, Don't be worried about the boy and your slave Hagar. Do whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that you will have the descendants I have promised. I will also give many children to the son of the slave woman, so that they will become a nation. He too is your son. Early the next morning, Abraham gave Hagar some food and a leather bag full of water. He put the child on her back and sent her away. She left and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water was all gone, she left the child under a bush. There is so much wrong about this story. Let me try to make a list of what I think is going wrong here. First up, slavery. There are some who argue that slavery was simply how things were done in those times. My response is that if slavery is wrong now, it was wrong then. Treating another human being as a chattel or piece of property is wrong. And next is the manner of Hagar, the slave, becoming pregnant. We can take this in two parts. Sarah, her mistress, gives her to Abraham with the intent of him having sex with her and producing an heir. If Hagar is a slave, merely an object that is owned, then this might be seen as reasonable behaviour. It is not reasonable behaviour, not now, not then. Worse, in my opinion, is that Abraham went along with this idea. I think it's not unreasonable to consider that, obedience to her mistress aside, Hagar was probably an unwilling participant in this whole affair. Put simply, she was raped. Oh, you say, but Abraham was the amazing father of the Israelite race. If he had sex with her without her freely giving consent, and as a slave she could not do that, then he raped her. Then Sarah had her own son, and in a fit of jealous rage, insisted that her, how shall we call him, stepson perhaps, and his mother, be banished from the camp. This done with the vindictive expectation that in being left to fend for themselves in the wilderness, they would die and no longer be a problem for her. These days, we would call it attempted murder. Of course, Abraham, being the fine, upstanding man that he was, agreed to this course of action. Giving Hagar a jug of water, he sent the two of them into the desert, knowing that it was a virtual death sentence yet doing nothing further to provide for his son and his son's mother. As we know, Abraham then justifies his actions by telling everyone that God said it would be okay. Really? Your unconscionable behaviour is justified by saying it is okay with God. I don't know about you, but by the time I get to this point in the story, and I would argue it actually gets worse before it gets better, I'm fear steaming with anger at the whole thing. None of this behaviour is justified by God saying it's okay, and Ishmael will be the father of a nation. And might I say, shame on us if we attempt to justify how the people in the story have acted simply because they are famous. Now, having torn the story into pieces, I want to suggest we can learn from the excruciatingly bad behaviour exhibited here. It's mostly a case of learning what not to do, and so we'll make the most of our opportunity at this point. You'll likely have noticed that our theme today is creating is responsibility. There is the taking of responsibility. Yes, I have done this, and I take responsibility for what I have done. 
and there is having responsibility. I am responsible for what needs to be done of the sort a parent has for their child or a captain for their team. We could call it responsibility for the past and responsibility for the future. Neither Abraham nor Sarah exhibited any kind of responsibility in this little saga. Neither of them took or showed responsibility for the dilemma they faced in Hagar and Ishmael. They made truly horrible decisions that had led to the situation, and then, rather than admit those choices, they proceeded to, well, essentially cover up the crime by getting rid of the evidence. I'm not going to focus any more on the gravity of the crime. I want instead to dig a little into how important it is to own our actions. And in particular, I'm going to lean into our topic from last week of the other. It's often said that God doesn't have a scale of sin. It was only a white lie. No, it was a lie. I only stole a paperclip. No, you stole. I'm not talking about inhumane rules like three strikes laws that sometimes come our way. This is about seeing ourselves as God sees us, broken and in need of Jesus in our lives. We're not cast off and left to rot. We are loved and held as God waits for us to turn toward him. The problem isn't in how God sees us. It is in how we see each other. When we see an other coming toward us, what do we think? What do we do? Sarah looked at Ishmael playing with Isaac and she saw an other. That Ishmael was an other of her own making mattered not at all. And this, I suggest, is where we so frequently struggle. We see an other and our instinctive response is to get rid of them. That may be simply by ignoring them like we would a beggar on the street. It might be by speaking poorly of them, as we might do of someone of a different ethnicity to our own. Let's be blunt here, racism at work. It might be by actively working to prevent people we don't like moving into our street. Or voting for the party most likely to come down hard on crime because it's never my people doing the crime as we conveniently forget the enormous damage done by white-collar crime and theft by banks and the like. In Sarah and Abraham, we are given a reminder that this kind of behaviour toward the other is evil at work. We don't need the devil in the mix to achieve evil. We're quite competent at creating it on our own. I think it's Alcoholics Anonymous who say that the first step to recovery is owning that you have a problem. I want to say today that we have a problem. It's not alcohol, it's not drugs or gambling or domestic violence. It is in failing to welcome the other and to show them the love and respect that Jesus would show. We all do it in one way or another, to a group of people or to individuals. It's time to turn that around, to learn from Abraham and Sarah and to do better. What do you think? The second reading today is from Luke chapter 8, verses 42b to 48. As Jesus went along, the people were crowding him from every side. Among them was a woman who had suffered from severe bleeding for 12 years. She had spent all she had on doctors but no one had been able to cure her. She came up in the crowd behind Jesus and touched the edge of his cloak, and her bleeding stopped at once. Jesus asked, Who touched me? Everyone denied it, and Peter said, Master, the people are all around you and crowding in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I knew it when power went out of me. The woman saw that she had been found out, so she came trembling and threw herself at Jesus' feet. There in front of everyone, she told him why she had touched him and how she had been healed at once. Jesus said to her, My daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. 
Have you noticed how those on the edges of society are frequently wrestling with health issues? Sometimes it's physical health, often it's mental health. More often than not, we don't notice these others at all because for the most part, they're hidden from our view. Of course, there are the occasional readily identifiable examples, the town drunk or the bag lady or similar. These people we point out and laugh at and give demeaning names. But mostly they're hidden behind closed doors, slowly decomposing into their base elements while the rest of the world passes them by without a thought. Woe betide one who decides to stand up for themselves and be seen. Take responsibility for yourself, we say. Do this, don't do that. Fix your problem, don't lean on society for your solutions. Lose weight, stop drinking, get off drugs, get a job. But do not, under any circumstances, expect me to invest in helping you. I am not and will not be held responsible for your condition. The woman who'd been suffering from bleeding for 12 years was just such an other. In fact, if she had followed her society's rules and expectations, she would never have been in the crowd in the first place. The Jewish rules around women and bleeding insisted that she isolate herself while in that condition. She had no money left to ease the passage of time, and so she lived on the fringe, likely existing on the limited food and support given to the excluded, something akin to our welfare benefit system. She had become other in every sense of the word. Sensing an opportunity to ease her condition, she worked her way into a position to touch Jesus' clothes. We can be fairly sure she was disguised, possibly even as a man, in order to get close. And then the moment of truth. Would her touch make any difference to her condition, to anything? She moves carefully, using the movement of the crowd to mask her progress. She reaches out, a touch, barely anything in the bustle of all that is going on around her. Instantly, she feels a shift in herself. Something has happened. Quickly, she moves back a little, attempting to melt into the crowd so she can escape unseen. But then Jesus stops and asks, Who touched me? Terror. She's going to be caught, and then she'll be punished. Her final condition may be worse than the past. Hope. That's crazy, Jesus. Look at all the people trying to get a bit of you. Of course people touched you. Dozens of them. Then again, someone touched me. Dread. There is no more hiding. She will be found out. Has been found out. They just don't know who yet. Perhaps in confessing they may show some mercy. Perhaps they won't stone her. It was me, and I've been healed. Astonishment. There is no condemnation. Only love and a blessing. She is still other to all these crowds of people. But to Jesus, she is family. No longer other, welcomed, loved, accepted. What a stark contrast between Sarah and Abraham and Jesus. Condemnation of the other or welcoming of the other. We will regularly find ourselves in situations where we can choose to condemn or to welcome the other. No matter how good we think we are at being inclusive, we will always find some people more difficult to accept than others. I suspect that is one of a myriad reasons we are challenged to not give up meeting together. We need the encouragement and support of others to be welcoming even when our instinct is to turn away. Here is what I would like to suggest we do with this. Let's take this idea of welcoming the other, with the goal of them no longer being other, and think about how we can do that. 
I'm not talking here about evangelizing or converting or any of that other stuff that fills us with fear and dismay. I think that is best left for the Holy Spirit to worry about. No, I'm talking about being welcoming and loving to those we might call other. And remember, what makes your other is likely different to what makes mine. I know what I need to work on. How about you? Let's not do this alone either. Let's actively search for ways to encourage and strengthen each other in the process. Let's aim to reduce the population of other, one at a time. We pray. God, who receives every person in love, no matter who they are or how they are, who supports, encourages, teaches and disciplines, who welcomed us while we were still other. Teach us to follow the example Jesus set for us. Teach us to look beyond our prejudices, to see the loved person behind them. Strengthen us to be disciplined in how we serve and honour every person you love, choosing for their best even when our natural instinct is to turn away. Help us to be a community of people who are recognised for our love, not simply for ourselves, but for everyone we encounter. Through Jesus, who welcomed the other, we pray. Amen.